We're kicking off, as you can see, uh, our Christmas uh, season really officially. I want to thank our team here who did a tremendous job. It was a busy week. There was a lot of parties. Our staff party was this past week. There was a number of different things. But man, they did a tremendous job putting the building together. So absolutely want to thank them for all the work that they have done. To celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, amen, the birth of Jesus. I told Amber last night, we were singing that song uh, right before the message, the King of Kings, and it reminded me of a story, but not a joke story, a true story. Uh, 2013, Tristan was born, and so it was our first year doing Christmas, uh, a Christmas card, like with his picture on it. And so Amber put his picture on a Christmas card, and it was just one picture of him. And, you know, I didn't look at what she picked out. I didn't look at, you know, the phrase until it came home. And we had a stack of about, I don't know, what, 50 Christmas cards. And I looked on the card, and it had a big picture of Tristan, and at the top it said, a king is born. So it was not a good, it was supposed to be for Jesus, a king is born, but it looked like we were saying that, so no one received a Christmas card from us that first year. Go to the next year, you would think, okay, we got this down, right? We figured this out. And so we go the next year, we find a phrase that is appropriate, Isaiah 7, 14, we come home. We got our stack of 50, and it says, Merry Christmas from the Jones family. (laughs) Amber forgot to change the last name. (laughs) So people didn't get Christmas cards until our son was like five, and then they're like, oh, the birth is, they have a child, and he's in college. All right, take your Bibles with me if you would. And turn with me to the Gospel of John. I love this time of year, man. I love this time of year as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. It does remind me of a story. This is a bad joke story, all right? There was no sigh, so I could tell you didn't know what I was going to say, and so it's a joke story. pastor was pastoring in uh, the New England area, but the Lord called him to the south, and so he moved to North Carolina, a little bitty country town in North Carolina, and he was serving as a pastor. It was around Christmas time, and so he was traveling around to all his different church members, and they were talking, introducing themselves, and he came to this one yard, and he noticed out front was the nativity scene. But in the nativity scene, he noticed that the wise men were dressed in firefighters outfits, and he was intrigued by that. So he knocks on the lady's door, and he says, ma'am, I'm a new pastor. Da, da, da. He's like, you know, I'd like to introduce myself. They start talking. He's like, uh, can I ask you a question? She's like, sure. He's like, I noticed your nativity scene out front. I noticed you have the three wives, but I also noticed, but they're, they're in fire gear. He said, she said, yeah, that's biblical. And he said, ma'am, I've, I've taught this story. I've preached this story. I'm not sure what you're talking about. She said, well, read the passage. And he read the passage. He said, I'm still not sure. She said, it says right there that the wise men came from afar. John chapter 1, North Carolina, far, fire, anyway. Y'all need to go back to that parade this morning. All right, here we go, John 1. All right, so the title of the series is His Story, okay? So this is what we're going to do. Coming off of Habakkuk, and this is really how the Lord's, I know, stirred my heart. If you've been with us the last six weeks, we're in the minor prophet of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, the setting, if you remember, is 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And what you find in the story of Habakkuk, really only three chapters, right, is you see the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, but you see the promise of God. You see the thread that runs all the way back from Genesis, right? All the way back from Genesis 3, and we've talked about this, where where sin entered into humanity there in the Garden of Eden. God declared the first really Christmas verse of the Bible, which is Genesis 3.15. It's the first prophecy of the Bible. Where God declares in the moment where sinners and man be hidden into humanity. And what I love about this is you don't just see the judgment of God come flowing. You see the grace of God right up front. Here's Adam and Eve. They've done the one thing that God told them not to do. And here they are. They're hiding themselves. They're afraid. They're ashamed. And the Bible says that in that moment, God displays grace. And he announces that there will come one, right, from the seed of a woman. That, yes, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head, the serpent's head. And we saw last week, even in the declaration of Habakkuk in chapter 3, as he talks about it, as he's praying, and he's declaring that, 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 that from the seed of God, that the house of the evil would be crushed. And it's a direct reference to, once again, the Christmas story. And so it really is all about a promise-keeping God. I mean, it's the greatest love letter really ever written to us. A God that pursues us. And that's what I want you to see this morning is I want you to kind of approach the Christmas story with a fresh kind of take. And this is where I've come at it this past week, is I've just said, Lord, you know, don't allow this story to just wash over us simply because we've heard it many times. But to truly allow our minds to be captivated, to grab a hold of, of the, the magnitude of what these verses are saying. 
And it really is the heart of the gospel. And so we're going to take kind of some different looks at the story of Christmas. This morning, we're going to kind of take really more of an eternal look. We're going to look at John 1, verses 1 through 3. We're also going to look at John 1, 14. You'll recognize some of those passages. Next week, we're going to kind of look at the Old Testament view of Christmas, as we'll actually go to the time period of Isaiah, 100 years before Habakkuk, look at his prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14. We'll come in the next week, which is the week before Christmas, and we'll really kind of land more in kind of the New Testament, kind of the birth narratives, Matthew 1, 18 through 25. And then at Christmas Eve, we'll really kind of put a period on the end of this, really talking about the eternal ramifications of Christmas. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and stand with me in reverence for reading God's Word. The title of the message this morning is In the Beginning. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to pull back and really kind of take a, an eternal view of Christmas. What I want you to see this morning, again, I think so many times we think of the beginning of the story, the beginning of Jesus right there in Bethlehem, but I want us to get beyond that. And I want us to see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, something that, again, is beyond what my mind can wrap itself around. But that before the creation of this world, there was God. There's never been a beginning. There will never be an end. That what's amazing about the Christmas story is the eternal God, Jesus Christ, who had no beginning eternally speaking, has a beginning physically speaking. And that truly is what we celebrate at Christmas. And really, the story of Christmas can be summed up in John 1.14. But let's start with these first three verses because we're going to really look at, in many ways, kind of a theological view of Christmas. As we know, Matthew and Luke gives the birth of narrative, so they're given the historical account. Here is John, the Apostle John, a firsthand eyewitness account, but rather than kind of giving the details of the birth, they've already given that. Matthew and Luke, he gives really kind of, okay, what's the theological ramp? What's, what's kind of the, the spiritual side of this, the eternal side? John 1.1, 1, 1, look at what it says. In the beginning was, say it with me, the... Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made, don't miss this, through Him and without Him, nothing was made that was made. The Creator God, Jesus, directly. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. Jump down to verse 14 if you would. This is really Christmas in summary. And the Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Christmas season, Lord, because we know that it's Christmas that leads to Easter. That, Lord, these are not just things that we go through as traditions with our families, but, Lord, these are stories, historical accounts of promises that you fulfilled, uh, promises that you declared many, many years ago, but Lord, you are a promise-keeping God, and we thank you for that. And our greatest need, forgiveness, our greatest need, your grace, your love, your mercy was displayed and demonstrated through your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, please don't allow us to just go through this, Lord, as we move into the month of December, and we've got all these things scheduled in our calendars and parties and plans and all that, Lord, may we not miss the true message behind this. But Lord, again, it points us to our greatest problem problem of our sins. And your word tells us for all have sinned, every one of us in this place, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we know there's nothing we can do to bridge that gap, Lord. That's what leads us to the Christmas story, that you came for us, you pursued us, that Christ entered into his own creation so that he might die. So Lord, may we not lose sight of truly what it is we celebrate at Christmas. Lord, we give you praise for our Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I remember years ago being in seminary and, and hearing, uh, sitting in, we would do these Old Testament surveys, New Testament surveys, where they worked through, you know, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And I remember uh, one of the guys asking the professor, in your opinion, what do you think or see in the Bible as the greatest miracle of all? That's a pretty big question, right? I mean, we have a book filled with miracles from Old Testament to New Testament. Well, in your opinion, professor, what, what is the greatest miracle that you see in the Bible? Now, I thought he would have struggled with that. I thought maybe he would have hesitated with that. But without any hesitation, he immediately just said the incarnation of Christ. He said the incarnation of Christ. He said, again, to wrap your mind, he said, the problem with this, he said, again, as church-going people, we grew up with this story. We grew up hearing about it in Sunday school. We grew up hearing about it at church. We grew up seeing the nativity scenes and all that. And if you're not careful, the story of Christmas can just kind of be, oh, yeah, the birth of Jesus. He said, but to really take a step back and to really allow your mind to grab a hold of this, that God would take on flesh and bones. 
that the God that created everything that we see, I mean, we're talking about creation, right? We're talking about how the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God, that all you have to do is go outside and you look at the stars, the moon, the sun, the mountains, and what do you see? You see God's glory. You see God's power, that the creator God is our savior God, that that same God would humble himself. Again, allow this, the one who created all that we see and enter into his own creation as a child. And again, I remember sitting there thinking to myself, again, yeah, I mean, it it really all comes back to that, right? I mean, uh, our faith, it really hinges upon the incarnation of Christ. And that's why Jesus says in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you believe that, say amen, amen? It's the way it has to be because it's only in that scenario where you find God dying for man. Everything else, you find man's attempt. Every other religion, you find man's attempt. You find our feeble way of trying to get ourselves to God, and we see it everywhere. You see that with man-made religion. You see that with people trying to to earn their way to heaven. What we see in the story of Christmas is there is nothing we can do to bridge that gap. But you see in the story of Christmas that we don't have to because God did it for us. He pursued us, he initiated it, and he made us away. So really, you could all bring it down to 114. We're going to look at four verses. We're going to look at the first three, and we're going to really spend some time in John chapter 1, verse 14, as we break this down. So let's go to verse 1, if we would, of chapter 1, and let's just walk through. I want you to kind of see again kind of the theological side of this. Let's back up to Genesis 3.15. Let's look at the promise there in the garden. Let's even move our way to Habakkuk, 600 years before the birth of Jesus, and you see the thread of the promise being fulfilled. Now, here is John giving a personal eyewitness account. Now, again, you have to understand how amazing this is. This could have easily been refuted. Uh, These words weren't written 200 years after Jesus. They were written within the same generation of Jesus. So there could have been anyone who would have said, no, 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 I was there. He appeared to 500 after his resurrection. No, 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 that's not true. I was there. But you don't find that. So what you find are these things are are, are validated through these accounts. Here is John's personal eyewitness account, and now he gives us these words. Look at what he says in verse 1. In the what? In the beginning. Well, let's define that. Notice what he's saying. He's not saying that there's the beginning to Jesus. Now, we know the physical beginning of Jesus. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. The beginning is a reference to creation. We know that verse 3, he's getting ready to talk about creation. So he says, in the beginning, in the beginning, at creation was the word. You could say this, in the beginning, the God who knew no time stepped out of time into time to create time. In the beginning, in the beginning of creation was Jesus. In the beginning, not, that was not his beginning. He was there in the beginning of creation with the Father. Look at this. I love this. In the beginning was what? Say the what? Say what's, what's the title he's given? In the beginning was the word. This title is unique to John. He's the only one who uses this title in reference to Jesus, and it's a title that comes with a lot of weight. Now, just looking at it by definition, we notice the Greek word logos, which means to say or to communicate something. So we know that what John is saying is this, that Jesus is the icon of God, that Jesus is the communication of God, that Jesus, when he speaks, what do we see? What do we hear? The words of God. When we look at his actions, what do we see? The actions of God. In the way that he loves, what do we see? The love of God. In the way that he preaches and teaches, what do we see? The authority of God. In the beginning was the word. John says Jesus is the communication of God. You could basically say the manifestation of God, that in Christ we see what? God. And Jesus says that, right? John 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is, the bo- who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. John 14, 10, Jesus said this. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. But that word goes beyond just the communication of God. It just doesn't simply mean that Jesus is the voice of God and the actions of God. It goes deeper than that. You go into the Old Testament, if you were a first century Jew and you were a follower of God, when you saw that word, it would trigger something in your mind. In the Old Testament, the Bible declares that by the power of God's word, The world was created. So we know that by the word of God, everything that we see was created. But the Bible also says by his word, he holds creation together. Now this ties into verse three in just a moment. But up front, John says this, in the beginning was the word Jesus, equal to God, part of the Trinity of God, with God at creation. 
the creator God. Look at the next part. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This right here, I believe, is the greatest statement of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ found in the Bible. The Bible declares without any hesitation that Jesus was not part, Jesus was not some, Jesus was fully God. If you believe that, say amen. Amen? It doesn't work if he was not. You understand that? The gospel message doesn't work if he was not. If he was not fully God, none of this works. And what we find here is that John, in many ways, is countering heresy, that during this time, docetism was something that was spread, and which basically said this, Jesus was not fully physical, that he may have been the spirit of God. Now, think about what's the problem with that? There was no physical suffering. What's the problem with that? Well, the prophecy of Isaiah says that, that by his stripes, we are healed. So if there was no physical suffering, then that damages the message of the gospel. And so John wants to declare that this Jesus who was there with God at creation, this Jesus who is God, became a person. I love this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was, notice this, with God. The word with literally means towards our facing. So here's the picture that John is painting. The word was face to face with God. Jesus was face to face with God. So it's speaking of, again, their intimacy. What he's literally saying is this, Jesus and God acting together in unity in all things, a relationship always in perfect harmony acting as one. That's why I've heard people say that the hardest part of the cross was not the physical suffering of Jesus. I've heard pastors say this for years. The hardest part of the cross was when the father turned his back upon the son. That because of sin, not his, ours, that was laid upon his shoulder, that for the first time in all of eternity, no starting point, for the first time in all of eternity, there was a break in fellowship between the father and the son. Why? Because he who knew no sin became sin. We might become the righteousness of God in him. It's the Christmas message. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, and he says, let's just make sure we understand, and the Word was God. John says, listen, I saw it. I watched it. I saw the miracles. I watched him walk upon the water. I saw the animals react to him. I saw his power over nature. Listen, we beheld his glory, and we're getting ready to get to that verse. It basically means we studied, we looked upon, we gazed at his glory. John says, I saw this man, and I assure you, he was God. And let me just say this. If you believe the Bible, you cannot deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you say you believe the Bible, don't come to me and say, hey, he was just a good prophet, a good teacher, but I'm not sure that he was fully God. And my response to you is that you do not believe fully in the authority of the Bible. And when you start picking and choosing what you believe, listen, there's a slippery slope to that, and it can get you in trouble. Can I get an amen? He is God. Because apart from that, you missed the message. God dying for man. Salvation accomplished by him, initiated by him, nothing that we can do our own, nothing that we can even pursue on our own. It's the work of God. Look at what he says in verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. Well, thank you, John. You just told us that. Just want to remind us. Look at verse 3. It's one of the most amazing statements right here. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Again, so allow that truth to sink in. John says there would not have been anything made if he, Jesus, the one that we celebrate at Christmas, our Savior, if he personally had not made it, all things were made through him and for him. Reminds us of the words of Paul in Colossians 1.16, for by him, for by Jesus, all things, not some, not many, were created that are in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, or dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And so as we move into this Christmas season, allow this to sink in. Have you ever questioned the love of God? Come back to Christmas. The creator God, the author, the architect, entering into his creation. Guess what? That hill that he died on, he created it. The cross that he was nailed to, guess what? He created it. This Jesus that we celebrate here, at, uh, surrounded by animals, he created all those things. And he comes into his own creation as a helpless baby. Because there's no other way for you and I, sinful men and women, to be declared holy, righteous, for the throne of God, both the author and the architect. The Bible says this Jesus, that he is fully God. He created this world. He controls this world. And guess what? He has the absolute right to do in this world anything that he desires because it's his. Look at the next part. Actually, let's go down to verse 14. I'm going to come back to something in just a minute. Let's go down to verse 14. I want you to see this. i got to hurry. 
And the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. Let me just read that again. And the word, this Jesus, as he says in verse 1, the word who was with God, who was at the beginning with God, who is fully God, this word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. This statement right here is one of the most significant sentences written in the Bible. Why? Because it represents the heart and soul of the gospel. And the word became flesh, the incarnation of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, that we have a Savior who is not far off, that we have a Savior who came to us. In the midst of the darkest time, I want you to see this. We thought things were bad in the time of Habakkuk. Just fast forward about 600 years, it was real bad. And in the darkest of times, God shined his brightest light. And to think how crazy the one who had no eternal beginning as God has a physical beginning as a child. It's interesting the words that he uses here. He says this. He says, and the word became flesh, or your translation may say, was made flesh. Now, that's an interesting phrase. It literally means to become. And so what is John saying? He expresses the idea of becoming something that he had not been before. It's not saying he didn't exist. He existed for all of eternity. But now at this moment, Jesus is becoming something that he had not been before. The word had always been the word. But the incarnation he became, what does it say? Verse 14, he became flesh. This is an interesting word. Again, he's countering that docetism. He's countering the fact that he was just a spirit because the word flesh really means, it means he encompasses the whole, mind, body, spirit. That physically he was human, mentally he was human, emotionally he was human. The Bible says, in all ways like us, yet without what? Sin. How crazy is that? I mean, this Jesus, right? I mean, let's reconcile these two things. Let's reconcile how the Bible describes Jesus and now seeing him as the one, uh, as a baby in a manger, right? I mean, I mean, this Jesus, the Bible says, whom God has appointed the heir of all things in a dirty, rotten stable. This Jesus who is in control over things that are visible, invisible. The Bible says thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, it all falls underneath him, this Jesus. This Jesus who the Bible describes is the image of the invisible God. This Jesus who is the brightness of God's glory, who is far greater than the angels, who the Bible says dwells in him, this Jesus, all of the Godhead body. This Jesus, head of all principalities and power, Coming to the world as a helpless child. Because before the foundations of creation, it was predetermined that this is the way it had to be. That God would die for man. And anything that bypasses Jesus is man-made. Anything that bypasses a Savior is generated on our own end. The story of Christmas and the story of the gospel comes directly from the heart of our God. What is the Christmas message? Right here. It tells us in verse 14. And the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. I love this. Hebrews 4.15 says what? For you do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Have you ever struggled with loneliness? Have you ever struggled with, man, I'm by myself? Let me tell you something, man. If you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, be encouraged. I know Christmas can be a difficult season. There are gonna be some of you struggling over these next couple of weeks. Be encouraged in the presence and the fellowship and the communion of a Savior who came for you, of someone who identifies and understands. The Bible says, hey, if you want someone who can understand what it's like, like to be hurt, to be let down, you have a Savior who was one call away. And it's just Jesus, right, that we don't have a God far off, that we have a high priest who came, who understands, who walked the path that he's called us to walk, who knows what it's like to be hurt by other people, who knows what it's like to be let down by other people. By the way, there was only one disciple at the cross. It was only John. Where were the rest of them? His best friends who had been with him for three and a half years. They're hiding, nowhere to be found. But his love was not based upon them. His love was in him. And his love was not based upon their actions or whether or not they deserved it, because if that was the case for us, we'd all be in trouble. But in spite of us, 
The word became flesh and he dwelt among us. I want you to see this. There's some Old Testament imagery here. It's beautiful because really the translation could be this. The word was made flesh and the word pitched his tent. That's what it basically means. And tabernacled among us. There's some Old Testament imagery here with the tabernacle and the incarnation of Christ. There's some really cool stuff here. If you think about it, what's the tabernacle? The tabernacle, you go back to Exodus, right? You go back to the time as God is leading his people into the promised land. They wandered in the wilderness for how many years? Does anybody know? 40 years. So let's think about this. The tabernacle, a temporary provision, a temporary provision to accommodate those 40 years in the wilderness. How long was Jesus upon this earth? Temporary condition in flesh and bones, how many years? 33 years, pretty similar. The tabernacle, the Bible says, was covered. It describes it with unattractive skin. How will we describe Jesus? Not just saying that he had bad skin. I'm sure he had real good skin because the Dead Sea's there and it's really good for your skin. That's all I'm talking about. I'm talking about that his skin, his humanness, covered the glory of God. Do you see where I'm going with that? The tabernacle, right? What does it say? It's the place of God's presence amongst his people. What do we see in Jesus? Jesus personally becomes God's presence amongst his people. The tabernacle is where God met with man in fellowship and communion. It's in Jesus that we today meet God in fellowship and communion, and it's only in Jesus. The tabernacle, what was that? It was the place where the high priest made atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus Christ, our great high priest, making the final sacrifice for our sins. And the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. Listen, this is not something that began in Bethlehem. This is not something that began in the Garden of Eden. This began in the heart of God way before the foundations of this earth. John says, understand something. Jesus is the communication of God. And the words that he speaks and the life that he lives. He says, Jesus is the manifestation of God. Not some, not a little. He is God. Then he says what? Jesus is the final revelation of God. You remember this passage, Hebrews 1, the Bible, uh, the book opens up with this. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers, how? By the prophets. Has in these last days now spoken to us, how? By his son. How has God revealed himself? No longer through Habakkuk, no longer through Isaiah, no longer through Jeremiah. Now through who? Jesus. As in these last days spoken to us, how? By Christ, Logos, the communication of God, whom he's appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, by the way, let me remind you of that, who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Do you see the Old Testament reference to the word? When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, John says, and the word became flesh, he dwelt among us, We beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. And look at what it says, full of grace and truth. Think about it. What are the two dominating qualities of the ministry and the life of Jesus? Grace and what? What is every one of us in this place in need of before God? We are in need of grace and truth. We stand before God, sinners. And in that moment, what do we need before truth? We need grace. And as he demonstrates his grace, it's in his grace that he speaks truth. And we see that all in the ministry of Jesus, right? I mean, he's constantly just uh, uh, on display of grace. I mean, he's being graceful. He's going to those that people would say, hey, why are you even in that place? Why are you with sinners? Why are you with those who God is obviously, uh, 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 what's the word, Uh, condemned because he's given them all these infirmities? Why are you with those people? This is grace. And it's grace and truth. As we celebrate Christmas, we see the fact that standing before the throne, desperate need of grace and desperate need of truth. I saw this quote years ago, and I thought it was so good. It said, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. Therefore, God sent us a savior. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith as not of yourselves, as the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's go to the middle portion of verse 14. We'll fill it in. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. But look at this middle statement, and we'll close with this. And we beheld his glory. Notice that phrase. It literally means 
that we gazed upon, we studied his glory, is what John is saying. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Of all the descriptions that John could give Jesus, this is the most significant. He describes him as the word. He describes him as the lamb of God, the light, the son of God, the Christ, the king of Israel. He describes him as the son of man 51 times in his letter. But the greatest description that John gives is right here in this passage. that He is the glory of the only begotten of the Father. I mean, imagine those shepherds in the field that night, right? When those angels came and delivered this message, imagine them receiving this message of hearing them refer to Jesus as Lord. That, hey, he's not just coming to deliver Israel, uh, politically speaking or economically speaking. No, God has come. That's what those shepherds heard that night in the field. God has come. Not a little bit of God, not some of God, that God has come in physical form to save people from their sins. And over 400 times throughout the writings of the New Testament, you see the word glory attached to Jesus. The glory of Christ. The glory of the Son. And it carries the idea of uniqueness, weight, of, of onlyness. That it's only him that receives this glory from the Father. It often describes his second coming. Let me give you this passage. Take your Bibles, go to Titus, if you would. So take a right. And this is a familiar passage, but you'll find this glorious appearing, glorious appearing. You'll find this phrase used many times, especially at his second coming. But it says this in Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. You want Christmas? You want a Christmas verse? Here it is, Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It's Christ. Teaching that denying ungodliness, worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly, in the present age, look at verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray you hear this this morning as we enter into this Christmas season. Who gave himself for us. Let's just simplify the message this morning. To simplify whatever it is you're dealing with or struggling with in your life. And boil it down to this. If you know Christ is your Savior, you've been forgiven of your sins, and you know that you have the promise of eternity in heaven, not the alternative, but eternity in hell, paying the price personally for all of your sins, then just allow this Christmas message to sink in, and he gave himself for us. He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. I'm going to ask you right where you are just to bow your heads. As we enter into these next couple of weeks, again, my prayer is not to get lost in all this. And because it's a story that I've heard and, and quite frankly preached many times, it's not allowed. message of Christmas to get lost in all. The one who created all that we see came for us. And I pray you hear that this morning, that God loves you. That regardless of what the enemy is saying to you or lying to you about, hearing the story of Christmas, in spite of you, God loves you. In spite of me, God loves me. While I was yet a sinner or yet undeserving, Christ still came. Not because I deserved it or I earned it, but in spite of that. And the Christmas message is really something that every day, right, we should wake up and go, Lord, you came for me. You came for me. You pursued me. Lost, separated, scared, afraid, on a road leading to hell, you pursued me. And that could not have happened you not come into your own creation. So to allow the message of Christmas again to be personal to your own story of salvation, not just some big message and it's something that we celebrate commercially, but the personal impact of Christmas upon your life. If you've been saved by the grace of God to just personally reflect upon what this means to you by yourself, 
that he came for you. That he came for you. That he gave himself for us. His own creation. A helpless child. It was all leading to a gruesome death. Listen, the cross was not a mistake, and it wasn't because things got out of hand. This was all a part of this plan. Even before Adam and Eve, this was established in the heart of God. The man would need a savior. And that savior, Jesus, came for us. So my prayer in this, as it will be each week, that First and foremost, I pray each person in this place has personally responded to the story of Christmas, meaning that you've responded to a personal Savior who loves you so much that he was willing to do all this so that we might know. In the midst of all that we got going on, because it's a message that we've heard many times, let's not miss this. This can be a difficult season. I recognize that. Oh, there's joy in the presence of our God. Because we rejoice in the God of our salvation. And that can't be touched in the blood of Jesus. I'm going to invite you to stand right where you are as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we thank you for your story, history. Lord, we thank you for your story. Lord, a story that we see all throughout your word. Whether we're reading in Genesis or Deuteronomy or Judges or Psalm, Lord, we see the story of a promise-keeping God. We thank you for that. Because, Lord, now on this side, Lord, we can look back and we see that. That all of this begins with the bad news. Lord, as sinners, we are desperately lost before you. But it's the bad news that sets us up to hear the good news, the gospel, the good news. That while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. So may the message of Christmas be something that's just not in the month of December. But every day we wake up praising the one who came and gave himself for us. Lord, I pray. If there's one here this morning who has never by faith called upon the name of Jesus, Lord, may you search their heart, stir their heart. May you draw them in a way that only you can. Lord, may you give them courage to to boldly profess something that they cannot see, something that they cannot prove, but to step in faith, Lord, in the stirring of their heart to profess their belief in Jesus. The Christmas story that a Savior came and he lived and he died, but it did not end with his death. He rose again. Lord, I pray if there's one here today who does not have the promise of eternity, who does not have the joy of salvation, may today be the day of salvation. As they by faith call upon the name of Jesus to believers in this place. Lord, draw us closer to you. Lord, may we feel your presence in a way this Christmas season like never before. And Lord, every time we see even the lights or the trees, or the reefs, or whatever it may be that this world wants to make it about, may we see Jesus, the one who came for us, the one who died for us, the one who for by grace we are saved through faith. We lift high the name of Jesus in this place, and we pray it in that name, and all of God's people said.